online. Now I'm very pleased to introduce the keynote speaker for the AFTD 2019 Education Conference. Martha Madison is an actor who appears regularly on Days of Our Lives and has also had roles in Criminal Minds, Without a Trace, Law and Order Criminal Intent, General Hospital, and One Mississippi. In 2008, her mother was diagnosed with behavioral variant FTD. Martha's here with us to share insights and lessons learned from her family's experience. You may, you may know Martha's work with us already. She's been an outspoken advocate for our community, appearing in an AFTD and Discovery produced public service announcement, appearing in numerous media pieces focused on FTD and sharing her story, and running in the 2018 Dallas Marathon in support of our mission. We're so grateful that she has chosen to share the keynote address with us. Please help me welcome Martha Madison. Hi, everybody. Uh, before I begin, I just want to thank you all for being here today and for everyone at AFTD for inviting me here to speak and share a little bit about my family and my mom's journey. Okay. FTD. Frontotemporal degeneration, PPA, behavioral variant, Pick's disease. I heard this series of words for the first time on January 25th, 2012, when my mother's neurologist finally diagnosed her with this rare form of dementia. But those words were a long time coming for us. This particular doctor's visit came about 11 years after the first time my mom got lost coming home from work a drive she made every day for 15 years. That day in 2001, I had traveled home to Houston from New York City for a weekend. We were scheduled to have dinner with two of my mother's close friends, and when they arrived at our house that evening, she was still not home. This was un unusual because she was obsessively punctual. Now keep in mind that cell phones weren't yet the norm, so I had to, uh, no way of really getting in touch with her. I did finally receive a call on our house landline. It was a gas station attendant telling me that my mother was there and she appeared lost. I asked to speak with her and when she got on the phone, she said in a very measured and unusually calm way, don't freak out, everything's fine. I just needed to come and get her. She put the gentleman back on the phone to let me know where she was so I could come and collect her. It turns out that that gas station was about three blocks away from my house. I know most of you have your own version of that day. Here is some of what my mom taught us and some of what I've taken from this difficult journey. But first, I want to give you a little context. I'm the youngest of my mother's three daughters. My sisters, Allison and Bo, and I came from my mom's two short-lived marriages. When I was just six years old, my mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I remember that day very well, too. I walked sheepishly into a hospital room where she was laying motionless. She had an eye patch over one eye, as well as numerous scary little tubes coming out of her arms and her hands. And she looked at me with a forced smile and bravely told me not to worry, reassured me that she would be better very soon. Like any other thing she told me, I believed her, I trusted her completely, and I knew that she'd be back to normal in just a day or two. Relapsing remitting MS is a disease of complete uncertainty. MS can attack out of nowhere. Each attack can require months or years of slow recovery, and so we had no choice but to adapt. Several years later, my mother elected to receive what was, at the time, a risky experimental treatment for MS. Although she was riddled with side effects, her MS symptoms did seem to improve, and in fact, she didn't have another major MS attack for nine more years after that. My mom's name is Barbara, by the way. Friends and family call her Barb. Before FTD, she could be described as an artist. She loved to draw and spent many uh, evenings sketching something or another. She also loved music. She played the piano and the guitar. And when we were little, she would sometimes serenade us to sleep by way of Puff the Magic Dragon. <laughs> 
she had a really beautiful singing voice and a laugh that was kind of melodic, but also a little mischievous. My mother was also brilliant, like really brilliant. She was completely dyslexic, but she had a serious IQ. <laughs> she was a math whiz, loved playing cards and doing puzzles. We spent almost every Friday night playing gin rummy for hours while watching Dallas and Falcon Crest, which is why I wanted to be a soap star. <laughs> she never let me win, though, so I knew when I did beat her every so often that I had earned it. To this day, I credit my mom with my competitive nature. Among our childhood friends, Barb was also considered the fun mom probably because she was really young. Um, you know, we didn't have very many rules in our house. She didn't believe in making too many rules for us because she felt that would create too many opportunities to fail. <laughs> but we knew the rules that she did set for us were important. One, never lie, steal, or cheat. Two, be home by curfew. And three, for the love of God, please don't get pregnant. <laughs> we obliged. <laughs> She also made it extremely clear that graduating from a four-year college was mandatory. I would go so far as to say that this was her only major goal as a parent and that countless choices she made when I was a child were made in pursuit of that critical achievement. Again, we all obliged. Now, my mom is, was, is the youngest of two daughters born to two World War II officers, a medic and a nurse. My grandmother actually outranked my grandfather. <laughs> Perhaps it was partly because of a disciplined upbringing that our mom was never touchy-feely, as she would say. She was the type of person who would just hand you a Band-Aid if you were bleeding and stare at you and walk away. <laughs> Before FTD, I remember only one time that she uttered the words, I love you. It was on 9-11 when I was living in New York City. This wasn't because she was cruel or mean or callous, but rather because affection just made her uncomfortable. Maybe it felt too soft for her taste. Before FTD, I only saw her cry one time as well, and that was when I boarded the plane to move to New York City in 1999. She always struggled expressing her feelings, which clearly I do not. <laughs> While I was living in New York and after the getting lost near my home episode, uh, I talked to my mom on the phone every single day. I was worried about her, but she assured me that her doctors felt her cognitive symptoms were a result of MS. She also assured me that the symptoms were manageable, no big deal. Our conversations became more fragmented. Her moods would swing drastically from day to day. Sometimes, just within the 30 or so minutes, we would be on the phone. For example, she would see my caller ID and almost always answer the phone in a giggly voice, Hi, Marthy! Yet more and more often, those same calls would end with her angrily hanging up on me, without any provocation. My mother made her living as an executive assistant at ExxonMobil. In 2003, she started to experience some decline in her abilities. She was losing speed at typing. She could no longer read a clock or comprehend time. I noticed that her handwriting, which was beautiful, by the way, had started to appear really shaky. That same year, her department was issued a new payroll system, and I noticed she was growing increasingly agitated by her inability to learn it. I mean, it really kept her up at night. She began experiencing real and frequent panic attacks, which she believed at the time was a heart condition. She was only 51 then. What would happen if she lost her job? What would happen uh, if she had no way to support herself? Where would she go? Within the year, my mother's fears were realized when her employer of nearly 15 years pulled the plug. Although I think she was relieved to some degree, she was also completely horrified and embarrassed. She needed more supervision, so we decided to move her to Dallas to be closer to where my sister Bo was working and raising her family. I was in Los Angeles working on Days of Our Lives, and our other sister Allison was raising her girls in Anchorage 
while making a name for herself in real estate. So there it is. This is how my sister Bo became the primary caregiver, completely based on geography and circumstance. None of us had any idea how intense Bo's new duties were going to become, but our mom taught us to be strong. So my sister would be the one to deal with grocery shopping, doctor's appointments, haircuts, making sure she took her meds at the same time every day, getting her out to exercise. As things progressed, Bo had to help her get dressed, shave her legs, make sure her teeth were brushed. Bo had the foresight to enroll her in horse therapy and researched and implemented music therapy. She cared for her home, made sure she ate, and even made sure the stray cat, who had now become my mom's cat, was fed and had regular vet checkups. Bo had to collect her from both the police and the hospital on more than one occasion. My sister did it all. She did every little thing, all while raising her children and launching a fitness business, <laughs> all while Allison and I were only able to participate from a distance. And so I was swimming in waves of guilt on a daily basis. <laughs> Trying to help care for someone from such a dis distance is really tough. So Allison and I traveled to Texas as much as we could. We called every day until my mom could no longer understand how to use a phone. We offered financial support for my mom and moral support for Bo, but nothing was really able to alleviate my guilt. The guilt of not only being absent, but of placing that type of responsibility on my sister was like a fully loaded rucksack. But this journey has also taught me gratitude. And I will never be able to articulate how grateful I am to Bo for everything that she has endured as my mother's primary caregiver. She was and is quite literally the lifesaver of our family. Excuse me. As my mom's disease progressed, my mother started displaying more intense and unusual behavior patterns. I'm sure many of you have faced this too. She would lash out at all of us for reasons that weren't based in reality. She would make accusations that her closest friends were plotting to steal her things. She engaged in hateful conversations with her father and her sister and would regularly call me to share her criticism of my physical appearance, noting her concern that I would likely be fired if I kept letting myself go. <laughs> she sent me face cream by Susan Lucci once. <laughs> we'll, we'll skip that part. <laughs> my mom would also have very creative delusions. There was a period when she believed that planes flying overhead were actually flying hospitals where my grandfather was working. My grandfather was a retired doctor by this time. She also struggled with impulse control and began hoarding two liter Di Diet Coke bottles. Once they were empty, and yes, she drank that much Diet Coke, she would fill them with water and store them in the garage, you know, in case we went to war and the neighbors needed water. These bottles would eventually cover the entire floor of her two-car garage. She also began compulsively shopping. She would hoard those free shopping catalogs that would come in the mail, and she would sit at the computer and buy gifts for all of us, ranging from clothes to face creams, and once actually mailed me a large box of those same catalogs as the actual birthday gift. A few months later, she sent me a multi-thousand dollar terracotta pot from Neiman Marcus, so clearly she still had good taste, but <laughs> she was unemployed and racking up tens of thousands of dollars in credit card debt. My sister Allison remembers my mom calling her frantically about the debt collectors harassing her. She couldn't understand because she, quote, kept giving them the money they were asking for, so Allison took the lead on this one. She quietly paid all of her outstanding bills and coached my mom on how not to pay strangers over the phone. To which my mom gratefully replied, 
how do you always have all the answers? In 2011, <clears throat> I got a troubling phone call from Allison. She was concerned about a conversation she had just had with my mom. Apparently, my mother was very depressed and recounted a recent day when she had walked to the local park with a loaded gun. She explained that she just wanted to this to end, but she didn't want Bo or her kids to find her like that. So she went to the park instead. She came close but she didn't think, quote, the guy in the sky would let her in if she did it. <sighs> My sisters and I knew we needed to respond. We just weren't really sure how to do that. So I flew to Texas, and we took mom to see her neurologist. Once she explained the event in her own words to the doctor, he was concerned for her safety and referred her to a state psychiatric facility where she would be committed and live for the next few weeks. The upside of this was twofold. One, they were able to adjust the dosage of her antidepressants, which seemed to make an immediate and positive impact. And two, when we returned her to the neurologist for a follow-up a month later, he was finally able to diagnose her with FTD. How did he know? What's FTD? Well, the answer was so simple. His mother had just died of FTD. He recognized my mom's speech patterns, behavior, and lack of other executive functions as hallmarks of this disease. So we went home and did what anyone would do in that situation, Googled it. I spent the next days and weeks reading as much about FTD as possible, and I had all the emotions that went along with that. I was so relieved to finally be reading about things that were familiar, and every sentence I read, I was like, yes, that's exactly how that happened, and when that happened. And then I also felt tremendous fear, like, oh, that's going to happen, and that's how it might end. The more I learned, the farther back in my memory I was able to go in recognizing her first symptoms to that day in 2001 when she got lost coming home from work that day. That was 11 years prior, and I had just read that the average lifespan for someone diagnosed with FTD was seven to eight years. But that was 11 years ago. So that rained down on me like a ton of bricks. We moved her into a memory care facility shortly after that. My sisters and I were all there that day, and we all tried in one way or another to sugarcoat it by explaining that this was just a trial, and if she didn't like it, she didn't have to stay. Although we knew that wasn't really true. My mom, hopeless and defeated, sat down on the bed and said, well, I guess this is where I'm going to die. You all can just go home now. And we all just sat closely together and cried. <laughs> A little ray of light, though, shone through during this time. They say that people with FTD lose their inhibitions. And in a positive way, my mother softened during this time. Her anger subsided and was replaced with a really gentle sweetness. She was kind and affectionate and showered us with hugs and giggles and I love yous. As her inhibitions crumbled, so did that iron shell around her. These changes made her more loving and more empathetic than I had ever known her to be. We would sometimes cuddle until she fell asleep, and she insisted on holding my hand everywhere we went, or even if we were just sitting next to each other. When I would leave, she would just watch through the doorway and smile and wave gleefully. <laughs> Unfortunately, she, she did decline quickly. Her speech became more jumbled and difficult to understand. She lost a lot of weight. Her hands and body were experiencing Parkinsonian tremors and rigidity. And then in 2013, she fell and fractured her pelvis. This would be the injury that would confine her to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. 
Ironically, though, her biggest fear when battling MS was that she would end up confined to a wheelchair. Yet it was just one short tumble out of her bed that did it. In June of that year, the doctors recommended hospice care. I was six months pregnant with my only child. Overwhelmed with grief that I would lose my mother, just as I was welcoming my daughter to the world. I was overwhelmed with guilt that her last days would be spent in this place she never wanted to be. I was overwhelmed with fear that by my mother passing on, that all of our shared moments, all of our shared conversations, and our shared experiences would vanish with her. But my mother is a badass. <laughs> And it's been six years since then. And in true Barb fashion, she is still fighting. My mother has always been a beacon of perseverance and tenacity, a five foot one tanker of stubbornness. And now, even at her weakest, she continues to be a symbol of strength to my sisters and our children and so many other people. I know a lot of this sounds dark and scary. I also know that a lot of you can unfortunately relate. But the experience of FTD also teaches us to find light in these moments when we can. I've learned a lot about life through this journey. I've learned a lot about recognizing and embracing the good stuff. A hug, a laugh, a simple I love you, or just sitting together in the quiet and stillness can hold more meaning than any conversation ever has. I've learned so much about compassion in these moments, and I can share that with my daughter. I don't remember my mom's voice anymore. It's been almost a decade since I've heard her speak a clear sentence. But there are times when she will grab my hand or look really intensely into my eyes to tell me that she's OK. She's not afraid. And I know each and every one of those moments will stay with me, every one. And it reminds me to be brave and to push through and keep fighting for her. As humans, we're inclined to run away from things that scare us. However, I learned from my mother that the only way to overcome fear is to run directly at it. Face it head on with honesty and courage. It's not easy, but we do it. We're facing an uncertainty that it can, at times can feel terrifying, but I find incredible comfort in knowing that we've all found each other. Whether it's a relationship we forge here today or a connection we make through the Facebook page, we're a community of people who speak the FTD language. All of us here today are here because we want to learn and share and band together as caregivers, fundraisers, and advocates in the name of those we love, and that is power. Just in my lifetime, we've seen illnesses like HIV go from terminal to chronic. We've seen the death rate for breast cancer decrease by 40% since the 1980s. We've seen vaccines come to market for once widespread diseases like chickenpox, HPV, hepatitis B, and we've nearly eradicated polio altogether. There are countless clinical trials going on for neurological disorders like MS, Parkinson's, and epilepsy, and a growing number of clinical trials for FTD, too. We're learning more about nutrition and the benefits of cannabis and CBD. My point is that in just the short 41 years that I've been on this earth, medical advances have provided significant hope to those who may have felt hopeless once before. And I like to think that many of the necessary initiatives to achieve those things may have grown out of rooms just like this one. I know that I'll never be able to make my mother well again, but perhaps we can move the needle for ourselves or for our children. If we continue to shine a light on this disease, bring awareness to the public and to the medical professionals who treat us, if we continue to raise money for additional research and development of new treatments, we really can make a difference. I mean, my mom took every opportunity to remind me that life is not fair. 
But I also believe that life is not without purpose. I believe a bit of my purpose in life is to advocate for my mom. Maybe a bit of yours can be inspired by something you've learned here today. Maybe it's for you to share something someone else needs to hear. Maybe it's to meet the person sitting directly to your left or to your right. Maybe it's to introduce someone here to the best doctor or the best caregiver you know. But make no mistake, it is not an accident that you're here today or at home watching this on live stream. I'm living in Texas now with my husband and my daughter closer to my mom. And this past December, like Ben said, I ran the Dallas Half Marathon, which is something I never thought I would do. <laughs> to raise awareness and support of AFTD's mission. I've also had a chance to use my role as an actor to reach new audiences and to help other families learn about this disease. It's my hope that some of them learn earlier than we did and that it helps them to find resources, help, and meaning in this journey a little bit sooner. Showing up in this fight is hard, but it's easier when we do it together. I just ask that you embrace your purpose in regards to FTD and answer that call. I've heard it said that life does not end at diagnosis, and our fight will not end without a cure. Thank you. <laughs>